Welcome back to another show of Revolutionary Health, the show that focuses on Black gay men's health and wellness. Make sure you follow us on all our social media, Twitter at Building Desire, Facebook and Instagram at The Counter Narrative. As always, we love hearing from you, so make sure you like, subscribe, comment, follow, tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend to tell their family. I'm Michael Ward, but this week we're continuing our COVID-19 criminalization series. I've got two exciting guests joining me. This episode, we've got Johnny Cornegay III, and as well, we've got L. Michael Gibson here. So I will let you both introduce yourselves and kind of lead us into what we'll be talking about this episode. So hey, everybody, my name is Johnny Ray Cornegay III. Um, I am the mobilization director for the Counter Narrative Project, and I am excited to be back on Revolutionary Health. Hey everybody, I'm L. Michael Gibson, founder and executive director of Black Bear Brotherhood. Happy to be here. Thank you both so much for joining me. So this episode, we want to talk about criminalization of people of size. So I just wanted to kick it off um, to you, Johnny, as well. How are people of size being targeted by COVID-19 narratives? Oh my goodness. So, um, and I'm going to I'm going to have Michael pick up some of this as well, but I will say this: that one of the things that I think I began to notice early on um, in the the pandemic narrative, as people began to as people began as the deaths began to kind of show up in social media spaces, uh, one of the things I began to see was kind of a trend in um, who was dying. And I think it was a matter of time before there started to be this correlation between um, being a person of size and being vulnerable, particularly for death as it relates to COVID-19. Um, so I think this has just been building for, for a while. Michael, what are your thoughts? Um, I think that systems are not looking to be accountable for their missteps and how that's led to deaths. And so what systems always do is look for scapegoats. And I think that as long as the narrative was, oh, it's the elderly, there was kind of a situation of, oh, well, the, you know, both those are innocent victims, you know, innocent victims. Mm -hmm. um, and so, of course, we should care. While also, conversely, there was a narrative of, these people should be willing to die for the economy. These people should be willing to die for their grandchildren. <laughs> you know, like there was like both a, these are innocent victims, but these are not as valuable of bodies, you know, in a capitalist framework, you know, their productivity is over, their, their value is over. And so, um, but there wasn't a scapegoating narrative, right? Um, there was kind of a, oh, well, this is really kind of only affecting old people, and so the rest of us should really just get on with our lives. As it shifted, and it became clear that more and more people from their 20s to their 50s were also getting it and dying, um, and especially in America, where the majority of the people who <laughs> seemed to be getting it were not just elderly people, but were people um, of productivity years, for lack of a better word. Um, so I think that that was when that became kind of like a, oh, well, we have to figure out who to blame, you know, because it, it can't be the system. It can't, it can't be institutions. It can't be our government. It can't be our president. Um, and so then you started seeing reports about, oh, disproportionately, this is Black people. And so, that you know, that was like a week of lots and lots of articles from different media sources about Black people. Mm -hmm. And there was kind of like a, a creeping in of personal responsibility narratives and, and kind of dog whistles that you heard about, oh, diabetes and hypertension and, you know, which kinds of feeds into a meta narrative about uh, who are burdens on society and um, whose personal responsibility leads them to be burdens on society um, or lack of personal responsibility. And so there was kind of like a racialization narrative. Then it kind of, more recently has gotten more around big bodies. Well, why Americans over other countries? Um, and it's like, well, Americans are fatter, right? And, and then repeatedly I started seeing the phrase morbidly obese. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and then most recently, I think like even yesterday I was reading about, it was interesting, I think like New York Times, they did a, a piece in which they were 
listing the top reasons why people were dying. And initially, they said, uh, you know, hypertension, diabetes, and morbid obesity. But then when they listed the top, I think it was 13 conditions, morbid obesity wasn't a condition, right? Mm -hmm. It was like, diabetes, hypertension, and all of these other things. And this was actually around an article I just posted re- today on asthma, right? Because they found out asthma isn't as big of an issue as they had originally thought, um, which I was grateful for because I'm as- asthmatic. And I thought, if I get this, it's over for me. <laughs> so you started seeing more of a, oh, this is a fat people mm-hmm. problem, which intersects with this is a black people problem, right? Yes. So both of which have these narratives of laziness, um, that have these narratives of being burdens to economies um, and to the state. And so, I, and, and so, yeah, I think that we still haven't quite crystallized to fully stating the scapegoats, but it's happening. I mean, and you're starting to see the conservative response to that narrative come in through these protests, mm-hmm. right? Like, as long as they thought it was white people getting it, then people were willing to stay at home, even if they were you know, sneaking out here and there. Mm -hmm. But once it became, oh, this is fat people and black people and other, then it was like, oh, I'm not going to go out that. The economy can't be crashing for that. (laughs) We can't have a Great Depression for that. Um, And so you started seeing a change. And and I I think that that's a dangerous change. I think it's a a criminalization of people for the bodies that they live in. and, and that those people are still, quote unquote, innocent victims. Mm-hmm. So um, I, one thing I wanted to pick up on, if I if I can, Michael, is mm-hmm. I think we need to definitely say and actually there's a piece in Wired about this in that COVID-19 doesn't discriminate by body size. Let's just say that like period. that's a mm-hmm. fact, Get period. That's not it. Right. And I love, Michael, the way you frame that whole conversation, because it is that idea of trying to find the scapegoat. And it's almost like a it's like tiered. Right. And it's like now we're at the point where we're talking about black folks and we're talking about folks of size. So therefore, we can go outside now because those people can stay in. Right. If they die, who cares? Mm -hmm. And and that's the sad part. That is the sad part about it, especially when those sentiments are echoed with, you know, do it for Big Mama, do it for Pop Pop, all of those kind of things that were said, you know, recently from the people in leadership and is directly speaking to Black people. And he came under fire, especially for that, which I think to me, instead of finding the scapegoats, the broader conversation that we can be having are pretty much stigma, you know, stigma of who who gets to live, who gets to die, why don't we have enough uh, protective equipment. Mm-hmm. We're 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 now hopefully spotlighting all of these issues about Black people's access to food, resources, healthcare, shelter, all of these other things that we can talk about and bring into the conversation instead of finding who's to blame, you mm-hmm. know, for this spreading. Mm-hmm. I mean, even if you so, even a narrative about the the big body, right? Like, there's a great book called Fear of the Black Body that talks about the racialization of robust body sizes, because it wasn't that long ago that people of size were revered, right? Through most of, you know, human history, bigger bodies were revered as demonstrations of being healthier because they, you know, or at least being more wealthy, right? Because they were able to get more food. Um, and then, And then, you know, once it became kind of intersecting with the narrative about, you know, who was fat and that those were choices and people were making bad choices and laziness. Um, you know, even as recently as yesterday on one of my Facebook threads, somebody had posted that one of the top three people reasons why black people were dying was because they were fat and lazy. And I was from a black lesbian, right? Like, so even with, you know, who had like a Nazi and all these kind of very progressive things around her wall, of course I blocked her, but I thought that there was, <laughs> You know, it was interesting that, like, you know, but I, I also kind of scooter, like, girl, I have advanced degrees. I run a business. I founded things, like, and I'm fat. So, you know, your laziness. And, and most of the people I know who are big are very accomplished, are very out here working every day, sometimes two or three jobs. You know, so, you know, that fat, lazy, unhealthy, you know, 
it allows people to not look at food deserts. It allows people not to look at underlying health conditions like thyroid issues that I don't know people brothers have. Um, how we deal with different kinds of health conditions with steroids. Um, there's lots of reasons why people are fat that have nothing to do with personal choice. And if they were eating their way into a bigger body, that's okay too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, and, and, mm-hmm. and you know what that brings up for me, Michael, is this idea, and we don't talk about this because when we start talking about the ways that uh, society views views fat people, we have to talk about the fact that so many of us, I know this is true for me, where I'm always kind of viewed as the viewed as the 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 per, the protector, the person, the provider, the person who has to take care of other people, right? Mm-hmm. And so if I am the person that is responsible for doing those things because societally you tell me that that's what I'm supposed to do, I still have to go to work. I still have to provide. I still have to put myself right there on the front line to take care of people because that's what I, as a fat person, am supposed to do. I'm supposed to take care of you. That's what the system has told me to do. It's funny you say that, Johnny, because so as a person who runs an organization devoted to black men of size, I would say that, especially in the Midwestern chapters, quite a few of our brothers are in caregiver positions, you know, are at home right now taking care of parents, are trying to keep their parents safe, trying to keep them from going outside because you know, a lot of times these, ba- these boomers want to want to be outside. <laughs> they want to go visit auntie. They want to go to the grocery store. They want to go to church. Um, and a lot of my brothers are in those roles of putting themselves in the protector role to keep their family members out of harm's way. Um, you know, a lot of my brothers, you know, and I've said this on other groups and other uh, revolutionary health episodes, you know, some of the people I know who spend the most time in the gym are larger body people. They're constantly trying to lose weight on a diet, working out, you know. So this kind of like, and, and, and are taking personal responsibility. So these narratives are dangerous because they're inaccurate. These narratives are dangerous because in a situation like Detroit, where I live, where 30,000 people have COVID-19, and, and, and that's just the number that's on the books, it's probably closer to 300,000 because they say for every one you find, it's probably 10 you aren't. Um, health ventilators and who gets the get a health ventilator and who gets to get to live, right? Like, I don't trust that if I get COVID-19, that a doctor is going to prioritize my black gay big body over somebody else that they perceive as healthier, even though I don't have hypertension, I don't have diabetes, I don't have, you know, but this skinny person, this young person, you know, might have all these things and be chosen over me um, to live. Right. Like and that's and that's where we kind of are in places like New York and New Jersey, like where doctors are having to make decisions about who gets to live and who gets to die based on access. And given the discrimination against bigger bodies, I don't have confidence that bigger bodies won't be chosen. And I can't help but notice when I look at the news articles about the people who are dying, they are a lot of people of size. Which makes me ask questions mm-hmm. about the quality of care they receive. Absolutely. So absolutely no, I'm right there with you. And this this may be me just being unreasonably afraid. But that thing that you just mentioned, I actually, and I say this to my mom all the time when I have to go to the market, I'm like, I have to psych myself up to go to a place that has historically been a happy place where I can go and I can discover and I can be and I can just kind of do what I, I now am in a position where I'm like, going in here might kill me, even though I don't have some of those underlying health conditions that the CDC says is a problem. I'm not asthmatic. I don't have diabetes. I don't have hypertension. I don't have any of those things. But that thing you just mentioned, Michael, is, oh, crap, if I get sick, even though none of those, all of those other things fall away, the question is, will I get the quality of care needed so that I can survive survive this? Mm. I'm just trying to survive this. What happens to your parents? You're the caretaker. You know, and this is true for a lot of my brothers. You're the caretaker. And if you get it by going out to go to the grocery store or getting the things that are needed for the household, what happens? One of our brothers who's like six, five, um, 
four hundred pounds. He's a, a a deadlifter. He lifts. He's a, and he's losing it right now because he can't deadlift <laughs> weights in the gym because that's where he wants to be every day. Um, you know, he confided to me that the PPE equipment doesn't fit his face, right? Like so, even like how masks fit. I know, like for myself, like I'm I'm wearing these big old Maddie Moss Clark glasses because. I have to have a wide face, right? There's a limitation between my the glad glasses I can select that are going to fit my face. Some of this PPE equipment was not meant for big heads, bigger bodies, you know. So, like, you know, these those are types of things that um, people are risking um, in their continued discrimination. Listen, fat is the last vestige of discri- of acceptable discrimination. Um, Gay people discriminate against fat people. Black people discriminate against black people. <laughs> White people discriminate against black people. Like, it's the one last thing where everybody can make a joke and everybody get, you know, get their laugh on. Um, and so, but, you know, funny ha-ha until there's something like this going on. Mm-hmm. And then it's not so funny. Wow, yeah. And thank you both for, like, bringing this to our attention because it's definitely something that needs to be talked about and more people need to focus on. How do you feel us moving forward as we as we learn new stuff every day of about COVID-19. How do you both feel about us moving forward, what this looks like for people of size? How can how can people of size and just black people in general protect themselves moving forward in COVID-19? I think COVID-19 for all people is providing an opportunity. And I'm seeing a lot of you know on the left a lot of discussions about how this is an opportunity to talk about what the old normal looked like and why it wasn't working and who it wasn't working for. And I think that because so many different people have been impacted by this, workers who may not have been amenable to a better minimum wage conversation or a living wage conversation are now realizing, oh, wow, we may need some social democracy safety nets. That $1,200, you know, that people are desperate for, and that's assuming they get the max. Um, you know, other countries are giving way more, way longer. Uh, and, you know, so I think that this is an opportunity to have a conversation about how do we protect our vulnerable and who is vulnerable, you know, because it's a lot more people than uh, just the elderly and just our young. And we don't do a good job with either of those as is. Uh, and I think that we should seize this moment to have a conversation about what kind of society do we want coming out of this? And what has this revealed as fault lines that need to be cemented? I absolutely agree with you, Michael. And I would also add that, you know, in moving forward, and I'm going to address this for me personally, um, I think this is an opportunity for us to remember that we must be really vigilant in the information that we take in, where we take it in, and how we process it right? This is an opportunity for us to identify our biases, identify those things with that which we are uncomfortable with, and begin to truly um, peel some of that stuff back and see where that stuff comes from so that we could come out on the other side of this better. So that's something I want to see, is I want to see people, because we're spending so much time with ourselves, I want to see us come out on the other side of this better understanding ourselves better and the people that we are and trying to be the best version of ourselves on the other side of it. Mm, Yes. Thank you both. Great points, brother. Great questions and ways to move forward. I'm so excited we had this conversation (laughs) uh, with y'all. So thank you both for joining me this week uh, for this episode. Any last words or thoughts that you want the people to know before we get out of here? You know, just stay safe, people. Um, I know that there's an itch and cabin fever happening for quite a few of us. Uh, I would say listen to your conscious and public health people over politicians and capitalists and determining what you feel is safe for you to come back outside and you to restart living as quote unquote normal. Um, You know, people are ready to open this economy at a time where the pandemic could be having a second wave, um, and that, and it's it's dangerous, and I, I'm I'm scared. I'm scared for all of us, including those of us who survive it. What is that going to do for our mental health? So you know, I just you know urge people to stay safe as long as they can. 
Um, I echo what Michael just said. And I would also add, you know, stay as often as you can, as much as you can. I realize that there are people who have to work and who have to get out there. I would say do what you can to be safe while you're doing that. But if you have the ability to work from home, stay inside and take care of yourself and take care of your family um, because we need you here. We need you here. Yeah, so thank you both again for this incredible conversation. And to everyone out there as well, thank you for uh, tuning in to us with this episode of Revolutionary Health. Make sure you like, subscribe, follow us on all our social media platforms. Twitter, we're at Building Desire, Facebook and Instagram at The Counter Narrative. So put your comments below. How are you protecting yourselves? Let's keep this conversation going. We want to hear from all of you out there. Um, as always, be good to yourself. Have a good one, y'all.